going to put this monster in some airplane mode. Mom loves to call when I'm doing something. <laughs> it's like a an innate sense that she should call you right when something's Absolutely. happening. Absolutely. Yeah. I, wonder, I wonder what Ashley's doing. Like, how often do you talk to your mom? Um, not quite as often right now, but it's usually, I don't know, every couple days. Oh, really? Yeah, or any time I try to cook something. And is that often? And yeah, are, are if I'm, if I'm Are home. you a good cook? I'm not bad. I think what I'm really interested in is people who do something really wonderfully like you as an artist, songwriter, but also are you what else are you good at? And does that translate like your drive for being an artist into anything else in your life? That, that, that same drive. That, I think that drive pops up in um, handiwork. Really? Yeah, I like to fix stuff myself. And when it's too much for me to tackle, I'm, I'm not afraid at all to call in for, for the rescue party. Um, but, like, I had a problem with my air duct, my, my brand new house. It just kept flooding. The downstairs kept flooding. And then that finally results in an air duct getting full of water. And I was like, I can fix that. So did you go? Because what we have now is the ability to go to YouTube for anything. Yeah. Which changes you know, the game. Before I went to YouTube, though, I called. So my drummer is also a mechanic and an Eagle Scout, and he's awesome. I did not call him. I called his father. <laughs> who taught that that boy how to be all of those things. So I called um, George Hill, and I was like, here's what I want to do. And he was like, okay, here are the steps you need to make sure you take. So I did it. It's also funny, too, that when you're in an artistic business, um, like you are um, in, in my different worlds that I'm in, you're broke a long time, yeah. and you have to figure out how to do other things because since you're so broke, you have to learn or you just die. Right. Because you can't do music or I can't, you know, try to do radio or be a comedian because there's no money in it for the first forever. No, forever. So you have to fix your own crap and cook your own meals That's and, right. and learn to survive. And you become a good cook because you get tired of eating crappy food. And you kind of acquire all of these skills. Yeah. And then, then you get it kind of all figured out at once and you think you get, have it figured out. Then you realize you have no idea and you kind of start over again. Yeah. But I think it just has to do with your ability to be miserable and your tolerance for it. Agree. I mean, I know you're kind of joking. But I, no, that, but I mean, for that's... me, it was about going, well, this is uncomfortable, but I've all, it's always been uncomfortable for me, yeah. you know, growing up, you know, a poverty kid. And I was like, what's the worst that can happen? I stay the same? Like, right. So let's go. My vacuum broke two days ago. Just like the little spinny thing stopped being a spinny thing. And I thought, well, I can probably get someone to fix it. I can probably just buy another one. But what I'm going to do now is take it apart entirely. Did, you, you really did that? And fix it myself. Because, um, you know, before I lived back here, back, back in Nashville, I was over in Watertown. There was nobody around to help. And growing up, we didn't have a lot of money. And when something broke, my mother would fix it. My father would fix it. He can fix anything. But um, my mom's not afraid to take something apart and, and see how it works either. So, Do you feel like a little bit of you does that because you feel like that's where you come from? Because, I mean, at this point, you have plenty of money. You have, I can get another vacuum. Uh, yeah. Right, right. And I struggle with this too sometimes. Yep. Like, you could get a vacuum. You could hire somebody to get a vacuum and bring it to you and vacuum your floor. Oh, you yeah. could do, you, you could, you could. I didn't think about having someone else clean my house. That'd be great. And that's my, but a bit of that, I wonder if that, tradi is that instilled in you and that's what you just do because of where you come from and the people that raised you? Yeah, absolutely. I think our first instinct for, for people like you and I is to roll up our sleeves and, and figure it out for ourselves. And that's, cooking or fixing a vacuum cleaner or how do I make a career making stuff up and expect to be paid for it. And that's where it comes back over to. Yeah. I mean, that's it. You you had to go. I mean, listen, you you played what these small biker bars. <laughs> you know. Yeah. You've been to Cabot, Arkansas. Uh, many times. I mean, I know every everywhere that your story has gone from Jonesboro to Arkansas State yep. to like I that's that's my path as well, you know, one way or the other. Yeah. And so, you know, when I would know your story, but then I would kind of reread your story to make sure that I was still kind of clued in. Before I do this, I kind of go back over things. And it's just like, dang, like, that's, an, that's a different way to go about it as someone who wants to be um, known as a great songwriter and country music artist and a female. Right. To go into these bars. But there's no other way. That's I my point. I thought that's how it that's, was that's done. That's just how, right. <laughs> no one told me. Just like, you know, I'm left-handed, but I play guitar right-handed. And, um, and, but no one ever told me that was an option to restring it or turn it upside down or, or learn it another way. I just thought this was how things were done. So I, you know, would, would play some shows and, like, borrow people's equipment to do that and then save up and, and buy those pieces of equipment and run my own sound. And, um, you know, I didn't need, like, a fog machine or anything. But, you know, how to run monitors and how to how to ring out a room and, and all that. And I'm still not a great sound engineer, but I had to figure out how to do it all. 
and how to fund it all. Talk to me about when you first started playing shows live. Like before you learned how to play guitar. I wanna, we'll get to all that early, early stuff. But I want to know about your live, kind of your live show experience. Like was it at a bar or a church or like where do you for the first time go and ask for the affection of others you don't know? I didn't play like a lot of talent shows and stuff. In fact, I was pretty shy. It terrified me. It, would make, it used to make me cry for people to. to so you mean pay, like in high school? To or, pay me any attention. Right. Yeah, like middle school. Um, but I lived in, we lived really close to Hardy, you know, Mammoth Springs, really close to Hardy, Arkansas. And they have like, it's like a, um, canoe rentals and antique shops. And, and they had a little place in the gazebo where people would play music. And I did that and they gave me a hundred dollars to stand there and play. Who, who gave it to I you? I guess like, like the city. The it, city yeah, yeah. We're just like go caterwauler out by this gazebo for a couple of hours. I just played, you know, bluegrass songs and stuff. And that, so that's probably the first time. And when you first start playing, do you feel like, I'm pretty good at this, or do you feel like this is something I can do while I figure out what I'm good at? I knew I just I just wanted to do it, and I didn't know yet at that young age if I was good enough to do it. How old? Oh, man. I was probably 12 or 13 oh, no, when, when yeah. that happened. Wow. I started playing guitar when I was nine, but when I was like a little, little squirt, not any taller than, you know, what do they say, knee high to a grasshopper, um, we were at a bluegrass festival, and I had a plastic Telecaster. I've got a photo of it. And it had, like, Mickey Mouse or Kermit the Frog or something <laughs> on it. And um, this this band called the Tennessee Gentlemen was on stage, and they asked my mom, because I'm glued watching these guys, um, would she like to come and sit on the edge of the stage? So I did, and, and I didn't take my little plastic guitar at first. Um, and I sat there on the edge of the stage, and I watched them play, and then the audience erupted, of course, into applause, and my mom looked at me and she said, I knew, I knew you had it. Then you wanted to be on a stage and you wanted people to applaud you. What kind of music was played around you as a kid? Luckily, all kinds. Um, I mean, like the Carpenters, Love and Spoonful, so John Denver. 60s, 70s vibes, a lot yeah. of, yeah. Um, and then also my mom, she didn't try to shove classical music down our throats at all, but she would just kind of have it playing in the house. It sort of, so I'm, that we would ask questions. What is this song? And she'd be like, oh, that's Eine Kleine Nachtmusik by Mozart. There's a movie about him if you'd like to watch it. And you're like, oh, yeah, I want to watch a movie about this cool guy. So luckily, all of that was included. And then my dad um, was more like Christofferson, that area. He really liked those tor like tor tormented uh Yeah, I was going to ask you, which version of Christofferson? Yeah, Why Me, Lord, that version. Um, to this day, my favorite one of my favorite songs of all time, my favorite Christofferson song is uh, To Beat the Devil. Is that because of your dad? Yeah. yeah. Is there a song that was played in your house so much that, let's eliminate that one, but you hear it and, you, and it just puts you back. Like you feel that, like, dang, I remember being... Amanda. Like, not, yeah. Amanda. Because we had this, um, I think it was supposed to be like a family room, but it's where my dad kept, uh, there was like a gun safe in there and like guitars and the kids weren't really supposed to be in there a whole bunch um, unless you were going to go in there and use an instrument. And so... That is just about half a hallway away from the kitchen where my mom is doing dishes. And my dad was playing Amanda on the guitar and singing. And that high part that happens on the end of uh, my mom was singing it in the kitchen. And here I am kind of walking down the hallway and catching both. They're singing together. They don't know. He doesn't know that she's singing with him. And I'm hearing it. And just that song. You see what it does? I'm like, yeah, no. I, when I think about uh, Why Not Me from the Judds, because my mom used to sing that, and mom, you know, has since passed away. But it's that you, I mean, you kind of feel how you felt then, just for yeah. a split second. It's like there's also the intro to an Allison Krauss record. Uh, it was Allison Krauss in Union Station. It's the one I had it on vinyl. She's seated like a staircase or something with her fiddle in her hand, and I am seven ish or nine years old as soon as I hear that guitar riff start up, and I get giddy. My therapist at one point gave me a book and I've been through a decent amount of therapy um at this point in my life and that's a superpower yeah it's a tool it's like Batman had a superpower yes right like Batman had a bunch of cool stuff yes so he was a superhero that's right and so I feel like again I've accumulated cool tools and traits and um and she gave me a book that talked about music and you know the book talked about how when you hear something even when you smell something very specific for a split second in your brain it reacts the exact same way it did when you were what at whatever yeah. point. So just for a brief moment, you get that feeling again, like in your chest of like, oh man, that's that, 
that reminds me of being seven yeah. or nine or 13. Yeah, because I get, our brains really don't know the difference between an actual experience and the thought of that experience, I suppose. Right? And our now dumb, you're going what, Elon what, Musk. Like, are we I'm even like, living? Like, no, what do they call that? Yes. It's like our, our dumb lizard brain, our caveman brain. They just know that that experience is, is real. So that would make sense. I was actually studying the three parts of the brain yesterday, which is wild. And, you know, the bottom part of the brain is like the, the, the lizard brain. It's yeah. res- all, they have two modes. They are attacking, running, or relaxing. You know, it's those two. Right. They're either, ah, or they're just like, ah. There's nothing else. Right. And I try not to live like that. And I really work <laughs> on trying, as I've gotten older, I try not to react as much, and I try to respond more. I'm trying. I'm learning. Was, I love my therapist. And I know it was like probably trying to put overalls on a cat, trying to get me to go to therapy. And finally, I, it did, and I was like, this is awesome. Mm-hmm. I was talking yesterday with um, my therapist, not to go down a whole therapy train, but I was. he was like, when did you know about therapy? I was like, I didn't. I'm from population 772 Arkansas. Right. We were trying to afford, you know, a hamburger helper for dinner. Not you, yeah. We didn't know about mental it, health. It wasn't, it wasn't really an option. Right. I mean, everything under the rug is an option. Um, pray about it is an option in which that it does work, you know, for, for a lot of people that simply, simply praying about it, let, let go and let God, um, but also let go and let therapist. Let go and let, yeah. And for me, it was insurance. I was like, once I even discovered what insurance <laughs> let was. Let go and let insurance. Yeah, that's and, even and, better. And they were like, he was like, oh, that's how. So yeah, I was like 26. I got insurance for the first time. Yeah. So I started going to therapy and talking to somebody who, and I mean this in the best way possible, didn't give a crap about me. Yeah. I, that was so freeing. Because I know that you know you don't have to hang out with me for three days and deal with me. You're just going to give me your unbiased advice based on right. what I'm saying and your education. And that's yeah. how I feel with them. And so, but yeah, that's been a big tool for me. Um, did you, do you feel like you've had a whole different set of, like, I, would, I don't want to use the word obstacle, but since you've become so popular and famous, like, are you finding new struggles with fame, with notoriety? Because I would assume someone that comes from where you come from, again, like with experience, like ha- that, that's just an eye-opening world where you're like, sometimes I love it, but sometimes I really hate it. Well, yeah, when you, all you know is struggle and I have something to prove, I have something to prove, I have something to prove, but I still feel that way. I still like, you know, when you rescue a dog that spent its young life really hungry, that dog is always in hunger mode. And so I'm kind of that way. There's some things that I'm struggling with. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I live over in East Nashville where nobody cares, right? Um, it's a very cool part of town. It's a very cool part of town. Everybody's super cool about mm-hmm. stuff. And just, just recently as yesterday, I got stopped a few times, which I think is great. I've worked my whole life for someone to ask for a photo with me. But then I thought, oh, wow, I'm not used to that happening, I don't think. Um, my address got leaked mm. on the internet. That was super cool. Yeah. Because I don't live behind a that. gate. That sucks. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. it's like as, as things get better... And you feel like a lot of your problem, what I have learned is that problems just pivot and it's all yeah. in how, and it's all in how you, you, you accept them and realize that everybody's got them yep. and they've like, my life has gotten better in a lot of ways, but also I've had to take on a lot more responsibilities and challenges and I'm very proud of how I worked. And the same thing, sometimes I'm so tired, but I have to remind myself, I'm so grateful that I get to be tired doing something I love. Right. I don't know how you have time to be sitting across from me right now. Well, with the everything difference is, going on. I don't have a talent. And now you say that. I'm, mm. no, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm a swear to you, I have to hustle as my talent. Like, I have, noth- I have okay, nothing well, hustle, to offer. That, hustle is a talent. I, hustle okay, is a talent. I will agree with you there. But if you weren't talented, you wouldn't live behind a gate. I promise. Uh, that, true, but there are just some great. You're right. I'll let you have that one. <laughs> I, I'm not even going to argue that yeah, one. Okay. Thank I'll you. I'll let you have that thank one. Thank you. Um, your talent. When did you start to be told that you might be great at singing? I think it started with not being told to, to not sing when I wasn't great at singing. I was a little kid. Were singing. you a good little kid singing or were you a passionate little kid singing? I both. I was singing um, Somewhere Out There from An American Tale. and Like Five Wall Goes West? Oh, yeah. Somewhere out there. Wow. Oh, yeah. And um, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And then there was a record, um, there was a Ricky Skaggs record that I loved. It was like Live in London and um, a record by the Whites. I'm hanging around, just a little kid hoping you'll get lonely. Um, And mom never told me not to sing. There's six of us kids. So there's three boys and then a girl and then another boy and then me. The boy right before me, Daniel, 
used to throw like shoes and stuff at me and try to get me to shut up when I'm trying to learn to play mandolin. I'm learning to play guitar. I'm learning to play bass. And I'm singing all the time. And he was the one that was like, shut up. But he's also, <laughs> he lives really, he doesn't live far from me at all. And um, he's one of my biggest champions, my biggest cheerleaders. So um, my mom was on a bowling league. And like I said, I was a really shy kid, but I didn't mind singing as my way of communicating. Uh, so I would sing, I would go up to her friends at the bowling alley and say, do you want to hear me sing something from um, an American tale? And they were like, sure. You know, and I'd sing a few things <laughs> and I'd go get back in my chair and color in my coloring book. So I think not being necessarily told that I was great, but just not being, um, not being shamed about it from a really young age. Your dad played music. Your mom loved music. Yeah. Did that rub off on any of the other kids to where they... Yeah. Everybody can sing. Really? Everybody can sing. Wow. My sister has a beautiful voice. My mother has a beautiful voice. And in church, you know, we were required to know all of the parts, alto, tenor, soprano, bass, everything. My grandmother used to um, take my finger and move it along the page of the hymnal to show me what notes we were going to be singing. Even if it was the bass, we would sing. So your sing grandmother it. also? Everybody. Wow. On, on mom's side and dad's side. Everybody can sing. Um, I'm the only one that just kind of took off with it. I even have one of my brothers can was what played guitar in our younger years. And I don't know why he stopped. I had a brother that played trumpet. My sister played flute. Um, so we are a musical family. I'm just the only one that I guess it kind of stuck. It's interesting because I'm left-handed and I play guitar left-handed. When I first, like I went to a pawn shop and I was doing comedy and I thought, okay, I don't want to have to steal other people's music to do parodies. I want to actually write original comedy stuff. So I went to a pawn shop for 50 bucks. I bought a guitar. It was right-handed. And I just switched the strings around. But what happened was there's a nut in it, yeah. and it holds different sides. So I kept busting. Uh, right. I was going to say busting nuts. I kept breaking <laughs> the these strings. nuts. Yes. Yeah. Kept these breaking. nut. The strings kept breaking the, sh- the, the nut right. at the bottom it of the guitar. It was bursting it. it yes. Was like yes. just yes. Fracture, fracturing it. Oh, my God. That's so, okay. yes. <laughs> I got your back. So over and over. So, so it took a long time until I actually got a left-handed guitar. But I did not take to it well. I, I, m- music for me has been very difficult. I put a lot of work into, you know, learning chords and bar chords and for me very difficult and i can't sing i can sing just well enough to do comedy that people aren't distracted by my bad singing voice now i'm pretty funny you gotta give yourself more credit than that. i don't trust me okay i, I get enough credit don't okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> with you growing up with a family full of music did you feel like it was kind of intrinsic i loved the way it sounded when we all sang in church together um but yeah it just kind of just is playing in, guitar in me love it when you started yes Still assuming you got bloody fingers yes. and like everything, but like, do you feel like you got it? Well, they wouldn't let me play guitar at first because I was too small to hold it safely. So they let me bang on a mandolin. I remember I was probably in kindergarten or first grade going outside to the driveway and rubbing my fingers on the concrete because I thought that would help me get calluses. I was tired of my fingers being sore. And then when I'm nine years old, my dad takes me to a, a music store in Thayer, Missouri, which is just right across the line from Mammoth Spring. So up until now, I've been playing mandolin, and then I was big enough that I could sort of play with my mom's Alvarez, um, but kind of under supervision. They were going to get me a three-quarter size guitar, and I didn't know. So we went into this music store called Thayer Music, cleverly named, and Dad hands me this little three-quarter size K guitar, and he says, see if you can play something on that. And then he goes and talks to the guy, you know, and I was sitting there playing, like, go tell Aunt Rhody or something. And he walked back in to where I was. He said, can you play it? I showed him what I figured out. He said, it's time to leave. So I handed the guitar back to the guy um, behind the counter. And Dad said, nope, that's yours. Mm. Take it home. And so I wasn't great. Mom tells the story that it was like three days. My dad shows me like three chords when we get home. And about three days later, I'm bawling in the kitchen because I can't play and sing at the same time. (laughs) So I'm learning Snowbird. And uh, by Anne Murray, and I'm learning Steel Rails by Allison Krauss in Union Station, and I'm super upset. And Mom said, "Give it a week. Just just give it a week and see if if you feel better about it." So I don't I don't know. I think I think there wasn't there weren't a lot of distractions growing up on a farm, and with access to instruments, I think that helps everything kind of click. There's nothing else to do. That whole situation of you upset you can't sing and play that happened to me last week. Uh, same thing. I was like, I can't, I can't sing and play. Why can't I there do are, it? There are still certain things I can't, I can't sing and play. I can't do it. You ever get, um, I mean, it, it's just wild that you started on the mandolin. You, I, yeah. I don't hear of many people that 
because of their size, just start on the mandolin. <laughs> Mostly it's people learn a stringed instrument and they go to the mandolin. Right, yeah. But not because your literally hands are so My small. My hands were so tiny, yeah. Do you feel like that was a good lead into the guitar? It's good, really, really different. Because it really, is really so different. different. I feel like it's a bit more advanced. It is more advanced. And I think what it did for me is, even though I wasn't great at mandolin, I'm still terrible, um, but it did teach my right hand a lot about rhythm and making it hit the strings I want it to hit. So I didn't have to struggle when it came to guitar with how do I strum and what are the patterns. So I think that, that was probably beneficial, but I was just terrible. I have to imagine, because for me to have a relationship now with Ricky Skaggs is like the coolest thing. Yeah. But for someone who, because you're a bigger bluegrass fan than I was, I just wasn't exposed to much of it. I mean, we, it, us, it was pure country or it's 50s and 60s country. Got it. We didn't listen to a lot of 70s countries. You know, only Randy, only Randy Travis in the 80s. But my grandmother adopted me for a while. And, you know, if it was, it was a lot of gospel, Andy Griffith gospel records. Oh, yeah. A lot of, um, I thought Ray Charles was a country artist for the first. He was you know, a country artist. Yes. I mean, but, that, but I thought like that was what he did oh, because yeah. of my grandmother. Oh, yeah, that was his thing, yeah. And so, but, you know, Ricky Skaggs was about the only bluegrass influence that I had. But there was a while where he was like a, you know, pop country guy. Yeah. In, in terms of what was popular in country. Right. Not like people would assume a pop country guy is now. But to know Ricky is, is so cool to me. But I would imagine as someone who loved the mandolin and is, and is influenced and inspired by bluegrass, that's got to be pretty cool for you as well, right? It's awesome. We, were, we did an Opry. I don't remember how many Opry's ago it was. But my mandolin player, Chris, um, wasn't able to come to soundcheck. So Matt and I, the guitar player, went ahead to the stage. And we're just going to kind of get our ears about us. And it was almost time for Mr. Skaggs to have his sound check, or maybe he was finishing his up, but he was kind of, you know, uh, futzing around with a Telecaster and an amp and kind of doing stuff. And I walked on stage and was talking about, our mandolin player is going to be late, and I'm wishing our sound engineer the best of luck when he gets there. And I just looked at Mr. Skaggs and I said, you don't know any good mandolin players, do you? And he said, not biblically, no. And, <laughs> and then it occurs to me that what kind of life am I living right now where I just... I'm standing on the same stage as Ricky Skaggs and asking if he knows any good mainland players. It blows my mind. Blows my mind. Yeah, it's really cool, too. For me, the cool people, and I say cool, people that I thought were really neat when I was a kid, I still feel like are really neat. Yeah. Like Luke, Brian, he's just a dude now. He's my friend, so I don't... He's one of the nicest absolutely. people. Absolutely. That's why he's my friend. But yeah. I'm saying, like, it's, it's the... When we had in... Uh, Chestnut, for example, the nut. That's cool. I was like, this is the coolest thing in the whole world. Like yeah. that to me is still what excites me, you know, uh, being 41 years old and in Nashville. And I would imagine that for you, that whole, that, that history of country music and being able to be around those folks is a big deal as you're it's in town. It's a huge deal. Like, and just this past Opry, um, this last week, I was standing in my dressing room and Miss Jeannie Seeley came walking in, as she often does, mm -hmm. and, and says, hey, I think that's just the coolest thing. And Crystal Gale popped in one night. Oh, man, that's crazy, huh? Right? Yeah, that is insane. That's crazy. It's crazy to tell yourself that if when you're tw if you were to be able to tell your 12-year-old self that. that yeah. You, no, I would think you were high if you told me that. Yeah. Uh, I do want to talk about this this new song that you wrote, if I'm right here. You wrote this with Carly and Shane McAnally, yeah. the one that came out today. Yep. Um, so it's called Never Wanted to Be That Girl. I'm going to play a little clip of it here. I never wanted to be that girl. I'm always curious about, because it's you, Carly, and Shane, yeah. all three great songwriters. You and Carly are both artists. Who gets the song, and when you walk in and you have the idea, were you writing for Carly? Were you just writing? I think the way I understand it was my publisher asked, were there any artists I would like to write with? And I think Carly was posed the same question, and we had each mentioned each other's name. So that's how the write kind of happens. We both worked with Shane before and really liked what we got. So the three of us together was going to make sense. And they were already in the room chit-chatting by the time I got there. And Carly said, you can shoot it down if you want to, but I'd love to write a duet. And I said, that's awesome. That's what I was thinking the whole way here was when was the last time we had a female duet? And I think um, that you and I would have a really good shot at it, especially given that we write so well with Shane. And um, So you wrote to sing it together. Yeah, we wrote so it on, on, mind, on purpose, yeah. Nice. And so you write the song. Well, then who gets the song? I mean, it's obviously going to be on Carly's record. Right. But 
who I mean, is that a thing where it's it like well, it could have gone either way. Would would you have if the timing was right? Do you think you would have also put this song on your record? Right. So she right, she's cutting before we're cutting. So let's let her do that. In fact, there's a song I wrote um, recently with Kaylee Hammock and Nicolette Hayford, and Kaylee's gonna cut it. And I'm like, yeah, but I want to cut it too. And if what if I cut it first? It's so it's just um I don't know. It's just kind of a respect thing, and because I, I know Kaylee's gonna kill that song. And um, when Carly said she was putting this on 29 Written in Stone, I flipped. I love her. I oh, adore her. How long ago did you cut the song? Oh, when did we do this? Like, wh- when did you write it? When did you record it? It was only a couple of months. Here, let's see what the date was on the old work tape here. Oh, you have the work tape? Yeah. Oh, I'm man. Sure I do. That's, that's gold there. Um, I'm not sure if it's. And it's you know what? Think about it. Ashley, she doesn't have a case on her phone. Like, she go. Ashley just lives life. So March 23rd. She, just, she has no case on her phone. This is a case. That, that looks like a, a wallet. It's a case. Okay. It just goes in here. That's but you why. had to pull it out to look at a... That's why the case you're is all cra- crazy. Right. You're crazy. I'm, I'm a wild woman. Um, right. March 23rd of 2021. You wrote it. We wrote it. And then it was... It was probably April. The end of April. Yo, you cut it that quick. I think so. I think so, because in the beginning of May, I know I was like out of pocket for a while, so we had to have cut it before that. When you write a song that is a duet, and you're writing it for yourselves, at least in, when you're in the room, are you writing parts for yourselves that you each want to sing, or is it a group, okay, well, what if this verse just said this? Yeah, we kind of wanted to, because our options were, um, there was a Leanne Womack song that would have made a great duet back in the day, I'm the fool, in love with the fool, still in love with you, if that were a duet. Okay, well, we'd, we can't outdo that song. So let's look at the Reba McIntyre, Linda Davis, Does He Love You? We're not going to out-cool that song either. We're not going to reinvent that song. So we just thought, what if, we, what if we don't confront each other? What if we know about each other, but we don't confront each other or say, um, you know, damn you or damn me? Or call the guy a crap sack. We never did that either. We just decided that let's just start, let's just tell some stories about ourselves here and, and not be afraid. I'm not afraid to tell you I've gone through somebody's phone. You've done it too. And anybody who's not willing to admit that, it's okay. They can just lie about it. Most of them are in a case, though, and I don't feel like I'm going to break it. <laughs> like, you pull yours out, it's butt naked. I'm like, that's, oh, that's $1,400. What a way to crack. get busted, too. Yeah. Like, if you're going through somebody's phone, it's not in a case, then you drop it. You you're drop like, it. I don't know. It was the cat. Um, so we really did start, as, you know, by asking the question, who's the other woman? Who's our first character? And how does she come in contact with Guy? And maybe you just left an award show or maybe you just got your nails done and you don't you can't change your tire properly or whatever um it would be that innocent that you offer to help me change the tire and then you go i think you owe me a beer and you hit it off and then you just don't think you know you just don't think to ask any of those questions because this seems so fine but then when you run across something like you do in this song which just hey babe what time are you coming home and then you're like oh crap this is why we only go out on tuesdays this is why I've never been to his house. And you feel so stupid. And now you realize that you're kind of a piece of crap right now, but you didn't mean to be. And then on Carly's verse, we talked about women who didn't have a clue. Um, that was my mom. She didn't have a clue. And when and we found out about all of that stuff, it just, it just hit her like a ton of bricks. And there are ones that kind of find out about it and still make excuses for it. Um, and in that verse... He jumps in the shower consistently as soon as he gets home, and she picks up his phone and goes looking through it and finds me. And that's not a, a behavior that she would want to exhibit. When you go through someone's phone, an invasion of privacy that severe, there's something way, way, way wrong. You should know as soon as you have the feeling, right, that you want to look through someone's phone, that something's wrong enough to really have a, a conversation about it. You don't want to be that person. And bless his heart, man, you know. Hopefully there, there'll be some guys that hear this song too and go, I have got to stop doing that. Or some that go, I've got to put a better code on my phone, you know. Yeah, that's true. Plus, we have facial recognition and all that. That's true. That's true, too. Um, You know, you talk, and you have a history of writing very personally at times. At what point in your writing career did you feel like, okay, I now feel comfortable to do this? Because you have to, it's not even just about singing it publicly. It's about writing it with someone sometimes that you're not familiar with and sharing an extremely vulnerable story. Right. And then trying to make art out of a, a situation uh, yeah, or a life. Out of something uncomfortable. When did that kind of click for you that the power was in vulnerability? I, I loved, I, I thought I was unafraid earlier in my early 20s. I thought, you know, I'm, 
I'm writing these songs and they feel personal and this is great and hopefully it helps people. And then I heard a record called Killing Uncle Buzzy. Mm, for, yeah, um, for Travis. And it was the first time I'd ever heard Travis's name. Travis, by the way, Travis, Travis Meadows. If you're Travis Meadows. Yeah. And Minefield is the first song that my friend Shelly Tackett plays for me and then explains where the record came from, what was going on in his life. And I thought, I thought I've been, um, I thought I've been pretty vulnerable and, and truth telling here. And this guy just made that look like Mary had a little lamb. So, and then I, I kind of learned through listening and, and becoming friends with Travis and talking to him a bunch that not only can you do the thing that, that makes you a little bit uncomfortable, but you should, because that is number one, it's going to help heal you, but our overall goal here is to try to help somebody else too. So if it scares me, it's fine. I'll still do it. Do you have a song that you think back to and go, man, that's when I hit a, ne- a next level of being a songwriter or, or sharing a sense of vulnerability? Because I feel like I'm always growing, but every once in a while I go, okay, I think I just kind of clicked up to a new level. Do you think back to a song where you go, boy, this is, this is, whole, this is new territory for me, but I, I like where I'm going? Bible in a 44 for me was when I recognized myself as a songwriter. Really? Like, I think Trisha was the one talking to me about that song. Yeah. She sang the pants off of it. And yeah. with Patty Loveless singing the harmonies, I mean, they could sing the back of a cereal box and it would sound wonderful. But that was when I kind of went, all right, okay. It's, it's not a hobby. I can do this. And I think the next time that that click happened was probably Girl Going Nowhere um, because I was, I was unafraid to be like, man, almost everyone was like, you're insane. When you moved to town... Because you had done what a lot of artists do. You regional, you play regionally. Right. You try to get good where you get good, and then you move here. Uh, when you move here, like, what, did you move here to be a songwriter? Did you move here to be an artist? I did. Like, I moved here to be a songwriter. And who taught you that you could make enough money to have a, a, a nice living writing songs, or just a living at all? Lacey J. Dalton sang a song called 16th Avenue. That's when I tell my mom at, like, 12 years old, um, wherever 16th Avenue is is where I want to be. And she said, it's Nashville, Tennessee. Later that year, she takes me to Nashville, Tennessee, takes me to Spigma. I get to kind of experience the city. Did she take you because she knew you wanted? To- oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. So I knew through watching people here that, oh, this, this, this is a band, and they make a living. But mm. this guy, this guy wrote Going Against the Grain, Garth Brooks. Oh, he also wrote There Ain't No Future in the Past, Vince Gill. Songwriting is the other thing you can do. And I know, even at a young age, that – doing music on the level that I want to do it, you know, arenas, stadiums, amphitheaters, what I want to do someday, the chances are pretty slim. But I know that I've got the stuff. I've got all, I've got the basic edge of that blade. If we can sharpen it, I can make a living doing it. And I didn't care if I wound up just as dirt poor as Mozart in the end. This is, I got to do it. Man, I hear your mom bringing you to Nashville because you were inspired by a song as a kid and go, man, your mom loved the crap out of you. Oh, yeah. She's awesome. She's awesome. I mean, to have that much support. Then you're the sixth kid, too. Sixth. You know how tired she is? That's, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, you'd think she'd be all, all, all out of support yeah, by no. the sixth kid. No. We were driving over here. We went to, um, I have to get COVID tested like every two days, even though right. I have the vaccine. Right. We're, I have to fly again this weekend, so we're driving back. And my wife was like, uh, who's coming over today? And I said, Ashley McBride. And she was like, let me tell you. And she, she said, this is my song. And she played it. And this is what sucks. And she played One Night Standards. I was like, why is this your song? <laughs> like, we just got married. And she's like, no, it's just my vibe, though. I'm like, but you know what this is about, right? She goes, I don't care. You tell her I love her and this is my vibe. Well, thank you. Yeah, so we were, we, we were listening to this over here. And then I walk in and Reed, is, who's the video guy over here, Reed is singing it. Wasn't in the car with oh. us. Is this, <laughs> and I guess you haven't really been able to play a whole lot of shows. No. Since this song yeah. really popped. I was going to ask how how loud this song is sung back to you, but I guess maybe the sample size isn't big enough yet. It's, um, it gets sung just as much as Delonica does. Really? Yeah. I think since we had time, everyone had time to live with it for an entire year, like we put it out, and then we have to wait an entire year to tour it, but now everyone's had the ability to digest the whole record. So almost as many people know Styrofoam as know One Night Standards. Have you played a lot of shows? We started back May 30th. Okay, so you've had some time then. Mm-hmm. I'm wrong. You've had yeah. some time to actually go out and, and hear audiences. Yeah, and, and it's, it doesn't, it's, it's the same feeling every time somebody starts singing along. We were in Raleigh this last weekend with, um, with Luke Combs, and there's not a part of my show 
um, where we yell, you know, put your hands up or anything. It's not part of our show. But during, I can't remember if it was Dahlonega or Standards, way up in the nosebleeds, some cell phone lights came on. And within about 25 seconds, the whole arena had followed suit. And that is an amazing feeling. Especially after you haven't had it. Yeah. For a long time. Yeah. And especially that you can do that as not the main, the, the, the last act. Right. And by the way, God bless Luke Combs for putting you on before him. There ain't no chance I'll put you on before me. You're going to, you're gonna, I mean, I just wouldn't. I, I, there's I, I recently talked about this with someone, um, I think it was yesterday. You know, Miranda's the same way. You know, we're all full band. And when I'm out with Luke, it's Drew Parker or Ray Fulcher, all full band and me and, and Luke. And that, what that shows is someone that's so secure in their show and in their lane that they want us to succeed and be able to fully get our message across. Um, Miranda said at one time when, when Kaylee and I, uh, it was right after we did the fool around and fell in love thing. So, you know, Miranda and I were both using Jay Joyce as producers at the time. So I listened to some tracks off of her record. She listened to some off of mine and Kaylee asked, should I be here or should I go? Like, and Miranda said, why would you leave? She said, I didn't know. I didn't know. I couldn't, didn't know how to read the situation. And Miranda said, anybody who's ever made you feel like that considered you a threat because they didn't know their lane. And when they find their lane, they'll understand that you're not a threat. So I think it's awesome that Luke allows us to to do that full band. Yeah, I would have you by yourself without a microphone looking away from the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? On this that... 360 stage that we're working with right now, I am not facing the crowd a lot of the time. <laughs> uh, Hardy, Arkansas is about the same size as where I grew up. Where did you grow up? Well, it's called Mountain Pine. And the okay. literal population is 772. Got and, it. And there was a sawmill, and there's not anymore. So the town struggles. Right. Because what everybody used to do, they aren't doing anymore. Right. And so it's just the people that used to be there. Like, no one's moving in. And yeah. so so there's one store. What is Hardy like right now? Um, It looks like the town time forgot. It used to be multiple antique stores, canoe outfitters, um, a place called Beach Club Barbecue that was always hopping. And... I don't remember. It had to have been soon after I went to college that all those shops kind of closed up. There was a guy that did magic tricks in the big antique mall. He wore a top hat and he made Native American flutes out of out of pine and cedar, and he did sleight of hand tricks. and He taught me a ton of sleight of hand tricks when I was growing up. It was really sad to see all of that go away. There, you know, there used to be a dinner theater there in Hardy, Arkansas. I guess it's between Ash Flat and, and Hardy. It's all kind of it's three different towns, but it's all basically one town. Um, and I worked at that dinner theater back when it was hopping, and that breaks my heart, too, that would, the Arkansas Traveler Dinner Theater went away. Would you sing at that dinner theater? Oh, yes. So walk me through a night then at dinner theater, <laughs> because I waited tables, but I never sang. Okay, so it's an amphitheater um, down outside, so there's going to be, like for me, it was Music Man. I was Amaryllis in Music Man. But during dinner, I would go and serve, and there was a different show up inside the restaurant, and that was called Dreams of Hank and Patsy. And so I wore like a turquoise pearl snap. It had fringes all over it, which is not super healthy if you're a server <laughs> because, you know, butter beans and fringe, not, not friends. Um, but then it would, you know, nee, 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 and I'd have to hand you your, your sweet tea and go, sweet dreams. If you go up here and sing Patsy Klein songs. I loved it. So help me out again. There, there's an amphitheater and there's a show that people can just watch by itself. Yeah, you can, you can select to go just to the amphitheater show or you can come for the just the dinner show or you could go to both shows. And you would do, you'd have a role in both? Yeah, I liked, I liked to. And then when I, we weren't doing Music Man, then we did the Arkansas Traveler story about the cartographer that finds, you know, Ma and Pa. And... Right. Would, your, would you get bigger tips than other people? Because, I don't remember getting you, tips. <laughs> I, I did it from like fourth grade to tenth grade. I don't remember that really being a thing. Ninth and tenth grade, as you're nailing it, they're I, like, I just, "Hey, take an extra twenty bucks." No, there. I really just wanted to do it, and I loved the experience of learning to act. And I mean, you know what community theater, you know, could be like. Um, but I don't know what it's like to be have the potential to be next level while doing community theater. Which I wonder if that was the case with you. If you're you're doing your local stuff, but everybody else looks at you as like, "Why is she here?" Like you're so good. Like you did they did they kind of kick in the butt and go, You have got to do this as your thing. The the lady that owned the Arkansas Traveler Dinner Theater also when we were in the cast, um, you could take her acting classes. I think it was like once a week or whatever. Um, and never did anyone say, You're so good, why are you here? But she did say, I want you to know that you can do this. This is something you're gonna be good at. 
was it always what you were going to do as a 17 year old? Were you going to move to Nashville and be a songwriter? And thousand percent. That was it. Thousand percent. And I went to school like you're supposed to, and I studied music because I did. What else am I going to study? There's nothing else takes up my brain space. So here I go with my French horn off to Arkansas State. And I want to learn your, about your French horn, French horn scholarship at Arkansas State. Wow! Yeah, of every instrument, I think that's last on what I put the list of you playing. Uh, yeah, stuff. it's also that's the, the hardest Kirby one, right? Yeah, it's the hardest to walk down the hallway and not get your ass kicked, too. Wow! How, um, how do you start on French horn? Well, you start as a trumpet player, and then your school doesn't have enough French horn players, and the band director <laughs> asks you, "Can you figure out how to play a French horn?" And you say yes. So, you, but you got that good a French horn. Yeah, I got a scholarship full ride to Arkansas State. What's that like? How do you get a scholarship playing an instrument? Do you have to go and audition in front yes. of someone? Where do you so go to the school? You do. And also, so um, the the guy who was the French horn instructor at Arkansas State, his name was Robin Dower. And he had come and watched, you know, like the marching portion of our stuff and our concerts and things. And then I auditioned at Arkansas State. Did you feel good about your audition? I'm not a great French horn player. And I didn't love the instrument, not the way I love playing guitar. So it never, it didn't really, it didn't ever find its voice. The notes were there, the dynamics were there, but it didn't ever find its heart, really. I think if you put five horns in front of me, I don't know that I could identify a French horn. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so curvy, it's right? Curvy, it's curvy. Like super you, circular? It faces backwards, yeah, and you put your hand in its bell. That's wild. And it, it, you look really stupid playing You've done it, it all. Yeah. You look Ma- really mandolin, stupid playing French. <laughs> Wait, you have to do your hand as you're playing it? Yeah. To me, is that like a trombone when you're, when you're uh, sort of putting the to- the toilet plunger on the bo- back? Right. of Right. So it's it's not not to get too far into like here's how a French horn works. Oh, I'm curious, but it, it has to do with tuning. Yeah. So the way the way you place your hand and the way you shape it on the inside, if a note's out of tune, you can shape it that way. So your hand is si- yeah, it's sitting like that over the hole. It's inside. So like here's the bell. Yeah. And it just sits. The bell just sits. And the way you move your hand shapes. The sound you're hearing. Yeah, it can. You can use it to affect it. Wow. Because mm-hmm. back in the day, nerd time, kids. No, I, I'm Back in, I'm in the into day, it. French horns did not, you know, they, they have um, like valves. All the buttons. Yeah. I call them buttons. Buttons. Yeah, they have sure. buttons. Now they have four buttons. You have three finger ones and a thumb one. But back in the day, they were just this loopy, loopy, silly looking instrument with a bell. And that's how they changed pitches. It's called a hand horn. And it sounds ridiculous. If I were to bring in a French horn now. I'm terrible. What? But could you play something? Probably. Really? That's I've cool. got a flugelhorn at the house now um, because thanks to CMA Foundation, I got to be a, a, an ambassador for um, music education during what I'm calling the Great Separation. Uh, so I, I borrowed a French horn, I borrowed a mellophone, and I borrowed a flugelhorn. And I picked up my French horn and was awful. I mean, you gotta think. Probably to I'm, you. I'm though. 38 now. But probably to you. Like you. I was cool- like 22 the last time I played a French horn. You have. <laughs> I already thought you were cool, but now you're so freaking cool. Like you, you played a horn, and that's the coolest thing ever. That you can play horns and guitars. Well, thanks. Like that is that's that's t- like that's what gets you. That's what gets you beat up in the lunchroom. Is but what gets you beat up is also in later. And I could just from experience. You know, like I didn't get beat up every day of school for being the nerdy kid that wanted to read and with encyclopedias and jokes and. But that's what got me here. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's I, I loved learning about conducting. I learned all about musical theater. And just so, but when did that change to you? Because it seems like there's a style shift oh, or yeah. a shift in your focus. You could you could have all the light. You could like it, right? But a shift in your focus on what you wanted to do. When did it shift from, you know, being in a band playing horn type music to I'm gonna go play bars and like play soul. I was playing, I had formed kind of a Nickel Creek cover band with two guys, and we were called Dry County. And um, I really loved doing that. And so I'm playing in, like, the coffee houses around, or, like, in the basement of the Mexican restaurant. It was a real thing. It's called Julio's. Um, and I knew I wanted to do that. Well, then, since Jonesboro's not very far from Memphis, so I start going to Memphis and trying to play these coffee shops and open mic nights, and I start getting gigs in bars. So then I'm like 19 or 20 when I first start playing in bars and I get to do it for four hours. And then, you know, a friend, whoever I decide, we get like half, half off beer. And so I'm loving that. Well, I start doing that like five nights a week. So I'm missing class, missing class, missing class, falling farther and farther behind, failing music history, failing piano. I got kicked out of piano class. For not showing up? Yeah. yeah. Well, and also I cussed the instructor out, but it was, um, it was out of too. Christian love. And, um, um, I've got this class called pedagogy, right, which is teaching me how to teach. 
I don't know what that is. And that's, is it called pedagogy? Yeah, pedagogy. It's like a pedagogical class. So it's just you and an instructor, just, just like you and I are sitting here. And you've got your notebook and I've got mine. And you're going to teach me to teach a child a, a concept. And I won't say his name because I don't want him to get in trouble. But he closed his notebook and he said, um, you got to get out of here. I think you should drop out. You are young. You're skinny. Your hair is pretty. And things are going to happen easy for you. Five years from now, you're going to be fat and nobody's going to care. I think you should go. You don't love this music. You love that music. And what he said was kind of harsh, but, it, you know, um, what he meant was go forth, my child, and create the music you believe in, even though he said it that way. So I got up right then out of my chair, and I went and dropped out of school. Weird way to say it. Mm -hmm. But I, I think he said what I was looking for for someone to say to you at that musical dinner th theater. Like, where, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Weird way to say it. Weird That's way. All. I'll say that again. Weird, weird way to say weird, it. Weird, weird conversation there for, but did you feel like that was support? Yes. And I needed that too. I needed that get the hell out of my nest because I knew that's what I wanted to do. But I also knew I was supposed to be a good girl and finish my degree. And I'm, so, you know, I'm, I need to have some type of backup plan before I get to Nashville. And then I went, no, I don't. So I dropped out of school. I moved to Memphis. I continue playing in the bars there cut my teeth, find out that the reason I sound strange singing Lee and Womack style and Alison Krauss style is because that's not what's in me. What's in me is this thing that lives in this city, this weird Mississippi River. Oh, that's rock and roll. Great. And then that just kind of, I was like, ding, ding, ding. I got to take this to Nashville. I have to, to find out if I'm any good. So far, I've been a bluefish in a goldfish pond. And then I moved to a little bit bigger goldfish pond. And I want to be where all the other bluefish are. And what, how did you feel when you moved to Nashville, Land of the Giants? Where Scared. Yeah, I didn't know anybody. My friend Jenny worked at a storage place, and she lived in the apartment that was on site on the storage place. So I lived there with her until I got a house with some friends. Um, and I played at Dan McGinnis on, like, Tuesdays from 6 to 8 on the patio and just anywhere, anywhere I could. Did you feel like you could compete? Or when did you start to feel like you could compete here in town? There was there was a Monday night writer's night called Guinness Girls, and it was run by Terry Joe Box. And it was, at the time, the longest-running writer's night apart from Bluebird Cafe. And I went there, and I would watch Lisa Carver, Danielle Peck, um, people that I was like, wow, I can't believe I'm just watching her play a guitar right here instead of, you know, like in a big club or something. And I wanted to start. So at those, you can kind of, at the end of the night after the roster has played, you can play. And I started doing that. Well, then the woman that ran it, Terry Joe Box, who's now, we've been friends for a decade now, but um, she yelled, I'm, I'm, I don't want to curse on your show. You but can curse, I think it's all fine. I, I got through singing a song, and from the back of the patio, I hear, you singing bitch! And I thought that was a great thing, so I went and talked to her afterward, and uh, we set up a co-write, bang, bang, now, now I'm getting somewhere. I'm still terrified, because I'm, like you said, I'm in, I'm in the land of giants, but for someone who has is booking people like Danielle Peck and Lisa Carver and Shelly Tackett to give me that um, recognition. She was like, you should be playing here every Monday. You should be also doing this other writer's night that I do. So that was kind of the start of me going, yep, this is it. As an artist, because I think that's mostly how people know you now, you know, just generally yeah. people know you as, as the artist. When did it start to happen for you where you had people in management going, hey, I want to represent you? Because that means, I mean, that's their time and money going into yeah. representing someone. So that's that's a sacrifice on their end. Yeah, it's a big gamble. Who, when did that start happening for you? Let's see. I'm trying to figure out when, when Jalopies and Expensive Guitars, the EP, came out. And I was trying to kick up as much dust as I could. And I kicked up a little bit, but not enough. But I did get to um, start being booked through WME, which is nice. Which is an agency. Yes. yes. Um, shortly after that people start doing the thing where they're like, I have a giant house and jet skis and a leprechaun, like all kinds of weird shit gets said to you. Um, but I played a show at, I want to say it was 3rd and Lindsley, and into the room walks this guy and his assistant and another one of his employees, and he says, hi, my name is John Peets. Um, I like what you do, and I think I know what to do with it. I look forward to talking to you. That's it. The rest is history. I went and had my meeting with him, and I was like, yeah, where's this guy been for the last 10 years that I've been here? Is it because John walks a bit of a different path, too? 
He didn't throw me any fluff or try to sell me a car. He just walked in and said, hi, I like what you do. I'd love to help you do that. And then left, which leaves me with the follow that car feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, And he just, he's just no, he's just no bullshit, which was really refreshing. I have dear friends that also work with John, you know, as, as, and they were drawn to him because, again, he said, you know, this is how I work. Right. If you like to work this way, I think we'll work well together. And that was it. Yeah. I mean, same, similar story. Well, in the night I meet him, I don't really understand. I just go, I really like that guy. Mm-hmm. And then I go home and Google him. And then you realize. I just did big eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Then you realize. Yeah. If you're then following you along at home. Yeah. I realize who he is. And you knew immediately you wanted to work with him. Absolutely. What did he do to and for you as uh, in a form of um, having confidence? What did he do? Like, did he inspire you to chase a direction you wanted to chase? Did he just continue to push you with what you were already going? He literally gave me permission to go the direction I wanted to go. Because at the time, I was still writing for a publishing house, and I feel like we're always writing behind the curve. And they're like, you know, this is who's cutting, and you should write at that. I'm like, that's sort of like me just showing up to your house today with a flavor of ice cream and assuming that it's going to be your favorite. Um, And he said, you can stop writing that way. What if you only wrote songs you wanted to write? And if we get them cut, they get cut. And if you cut them, then you cut them. So here's permission to just, ooh, sorry, sorry guys, to just do your thing. Because I think your thing's going to work. And how much did that do for you psychologically? Oh, it made me walk pretty tall. It also scared me a little bit because now there's nothing holding me away from doing my thing. And if it falls, it's, it's all on me. Yeah. And there is a risk, obviously, to that. But the reward mm-hmm. is so free. Great. The reward's awesome. And I never wanted to fail on somebody else's terms. No. I always wanted to it's fail. It's so frustrating when somebody convinces yeah. you to, to go a direction and it doesn't work. Well, now you're a bona fide superstar. Is that weird to hear? Yes. That is weird to hear. My godchildren um, over the, I guess it was January when I went to see them. And we went to a coffee shop. Of course, we're all masked and everything. And um, little Cohen, who was eight at the time, he said, they call me Smash because yeah, they couldn't say my name when, I, when they were younger. And he said, Smash, do you think people are going to bother you in the coffee shop? And I said, I don't think so. And he said, I just kind of assumed everybody knows you because you're super famous. And I said, <laughs> I'm not super famous, buddy. That's okay. <laughs> so um, I had a conversation early on with Miranda. There was a situation I wanted to run past her because she's such a wealth of knowledge. And I said, and these people think I'm famous. I, I end the story with that. I said, and they're just mistaken. She said, they think you're famous and you don't. Then who do you think is right? Yeah. Mind blown. It's, it's kind of cool. It's kind of crazy how you got to this point, too, because you accepted and took the credibility, which you earned, and then the commercial success came later, and what they can never take from you is your credibility. Right. It's a hard, it's a hard thing to, to navigate because a lot of people want to be famous or have money right now and you give up some of your credibility in order to have the commercial success but the commercial success never lasts forever no at best it's cyclical yeah it's in cycles well, and you're running yeah, up and, and, and down and Ricky's been you know a little bit behind on on just absolutely putting their arms around me and that's okay because we we're selling out everything we do the merch numbers are are reflecting hugely um and it's just you know resonating with real fans in real time so like you said the commercial success will will catch up but for us, it's, it's been about connecting with folks and, and just play, playing our asses off every night. I love doing that. Still exciting for you. Absolutely. More exciting back at it. Did you realize that you loved it? Or what did that, the year away do for you? I didn't realize how much I had taken for granted. Um, I, if you had asked me prior to the Great Separation, do you think you take any of this life for granted? I would have been like, no, I soak up every minute of it. And then during that, I was like, Oh, man, I can name you two shows where I drank too much before a show, where I had to think about what I was doing on stage instead of just going out there. And those people paid money to see me have a buzz. No. To see me perform, to have a moment together. How dare I? Big slap on the wrist for me. To yourself. To to myself. Don't do it again. So no more. Don't do it again. What What an asshole move. Some my would, band deserves better than that. Some would say that it helps them perform better. Yeah, it helps me play pool better. 
I agree with you. you. Also, though, I, I had that whole year to sit and listen to board tapes, too, and go, oh, no. Oh, you listen to board tapes? Oh, no. Oh, like, I would go crazy. Yeah. You tear yourself apart. Did you, did, but, you, did you make yourself better doing that? Um, I just noticed some things. Were like, I wish I didn't do that, or I wish I didn't say that. Um, and in I don't, the, I don't in obsess over... the speaking over... part of a show? Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Would, would you ever hear yourself doing the same thing vocally that you didn't even know you did? And you're like, wow, when I hear that back, I, why do I keep doing that? Does that ever happen with you? Happens to me talking all the time. Yeah, and also if I see like a video clip and I'll be like, why did I lift my leg like that? I don't move like that. <laughs> you're up for three CMAs. Yes. When the list comes out and it's the, one, then two, then three. Bang. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that you're again, you're a superstar. When you see one, you're like, this is probably freaking cool. When you hit three, what do you think? Or do they call you and tell you three without you before you see the list? It, it, it's like someone, it's like me just climbing into a cage with a boxer and just before you can catch your breath, pow, pow, mm. pow. Because they're tweeting out the list. I'm seeing them tweet out the list right. live. And so that's why I ask if you actually saw it as it was coming down or if they just said, hey, you're up for female vocalist of the year. You're up for single of the I mean, these are big awards. Yeah, so I wake up um, and I've got like, 14 or 15 text messages and I see that one is from uh, Nicolette Hayford who's one of my best friends and co-writers I've got one from my day-to-day manager and I've got one from my publisher and, I've, and I'm like something bad has happened mm. a member of the band is sick someone has a broken bone something bad has happened and I opened it up and I chose Drew my day-to-day manager and I, I clicked on his little icon and there it was was the image with the three nominations and I went oh god were you expecting a couple? You hope. But again, we had a really weird time. Yeah, that's true. So it's really kind of hard to... That's true. Especially when you don't know all the criteria. Um, you know, how, like, how does that get decided? And I, I'm just... It doesn't get old, and I'm thankful for it, especially to see my little face up there next to Miranda's and Marin's and Carly's. And we'll go full circle here and kind of end, end on this a little bit. What does your mom think about that? She loves it. My mom will buy the merch. She doesn't ask for free merch. She are, you, will, are you kidding me? No, she buys it. She'll do that and then iron, I don't know how big this is, like maybe almost a foot tall letters, mom, on the back of the shirt. That's how into this she is. She loves it. She is tickled pink. My stepdad's the same way. When we played the Ryman, he was just weepy-eyed much of the time. Just They're so proud. That's really cool. I think to me, like that, in this whole story, and, you know, when I get to sit for an hour and talk to somebody, and it's different than doing a 10-minute interview, honestly. You know, Because oh, yeah. we get to sit and just kind of sit back and talk and, and learn, like, through all the struggles and the trials and people figuring out who you were, you figuring out who you were. Yeah. I, I, it all comes back to just your mom. We started with you going, yeah. she, she may call me during this. She takes you as a kid to Nashville. She puts mom on it. Still now. Puts still mom. does it. I don't know if your mom will hear this or not. but She will hear it. But I'll tell you, I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That, that's, t- I mean, that is, that, that moves me a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. That's, that's really cool. And congratulations to you. That is just, I mean, you are a testament to being ahead. Because you have been ahead of it. You've been ahead of it for the last few years. You've been ahead of where traditional media they, they, they wouldn't quite go there yet because for some reason they weren't comfortable. Yeah. But you've been so far ahead of it that at times I bet it was just so frustrating. Because <laughs> you're not just a little, you weren't just a little ahead of it, on it frankly. You were very, in, in many ways, stylistically, as a songwriter, yeah. you're so far ahead of it. I know that I would have been questioning if I was behind it, me personally. I, what, is, what am I doing wrong? Right, like wh- how did I miss so bad and, and is it ahead of me? But you were so, and it's, and it's now catching up to you. Mm-hmm. And now it's really neat to see, like, the fruits of that labor and the fruits of that tenacity and the fruits of that artistic liberty that you not only had, were given, and now sh- let others have. Like, it's just cool to see it all start to, you know, be a real tangible thing. Yeah, and I've had butterflies all week. I can't name a time when a single came out where I was like, I've got butterflies. Mm-hmm. You're just happy the single is coming out and you hope it gets ads. But I've just, I keep telling people, like, I've got butterflies all week. This is great. I'm in a fantastic mood. I'm going to listen to my favorite Pam Tellis record. Mm-hmm. Just so it's not something to even drink about, which I'm a, I'm a celebratory drinker and, and not, a, not a sad drinker or anything. Um, but I, it, I'm so happy and tickled to see all of this happening right now that I can't even pop a bottle about it. Well, you know, this, this song, 
with you and Carla. Gonna, you're going to play it on every award show. It's going to be so cool. I hope so. I mean, th- th- it's it's good. It's powerful. It's vulnerable. Like, it is what everyone's going to beg you to do. And in the end, that's kind of what the goal is. Yeah. Like, you're good at it, and people are begging you to do it. Now it's just you go pick the spot you want to do it. That's right. That's really cool. I'm so happy you came over. I am, too. This is, uh, you know, it's really cool for me, and I just, you know. Admi- I think it's so weird that two Arkansans, we're, we've been so disconnected. We haven't ever gotten to sit down. I think we've seen each other maybe twice at an award show, and it's always, hi, you know. One time I ran into it at a restaurant in Las Vegas. Yeah. And it was like, eh. Oh, there was it was the night that Carly and I actually met. You were in the same little, like, quarantined off little area. And Maybe. I, or I was just lonely. And she was don't, talking. Don't she was about to I talk to you. I could have just been by myself and lonely. And she handed me her wine glass. And and, and like the jackass I am, I asked her, because Hide the Wine was the single. And so I said, did you want me to hide this? And she just kind of <laughs> looked at me blankly. And I was like, okay, cool. We're not going to work that way. That's not how Carly and I are going to be friends. <laughs> Well, congratulations on the song. Thank you. Congratulations on the CMAs. Just congratulations on on everything. I hope that you're starting to feel fulfilled. I, if that's what this feeling is, then yeah, thousand percent. That's awesome. You guys follow Ashley. She's got her own name, which sometimes is weird. People are like, "Hey, it's me. I'm Clint Black," but only Clint Black one on Twitter. And I'm like, "Well, you couldn't get, just get Clint Black." Not that that's the exact case, but uh, at Ashley McBride, you guys go follow her. Um, you know, go check out Never Will. Maybe if for some reason you've been in a cave and you don't know who she is and you're like, okay, this is interesting. Yeah. Go go, go listen to the music. Yeah. I think you're one of, and I mean this is in a complimentary way, you're one of the few album artists. Thank you. That that I will invest. T- I'm so, I need a couple songs and I'm done. But right. there, there were a few. You, Casey, uh, Old Dominion. Yep. Brandy's that way. And you know what? It's all songwriting. Now that I start to say this out loud... It's all it's songwriting more yeah. than it is anything else. But you're definitely an album artist, and I don't know if that means anything. That's to a you. high compliment. Thank but you. Uh, but thank you for coming, and I think we'll wrap it up there. All right, there she is, Ashley McBride.